like you all to sit down and give me Psalms 131, verse 1 and verse 2. Psalms 131. King David, when he composed this song, he called it the song of ascension, song of elevation, ascending. And the lyrics give us a key on how we are to ascend deep calls unto deep engaging the presence of God and it all comes back to the heart where he says Lord my heart is not haughty neither is it naughty my heart is not haughty means there is no arrogance, there is no pride, there is no conceit or a condescending spirit, nor my eyes lofty, meaning that I have the right perspective. I don't look highly of myself and I don't look at people lowly as well. Where I see people with the eyes of the Father. You see, King David was checking his, himself, checking his heart, checking his perspective. And then he says, Neither do I concern myself with great matters. I don't get involved with Wall Street. I don't concern myself with uh, all the distraction that takes away my attention, which will take away my affection. Nor with things that are too profound for me. So what David is saying here, is I have the right attitude I have the right heart I have a teachable heart I have a heart that is pliable humble a heart surrendered to the Lord I have a right perspective I see everything from God's perspective I see people with the eyes of God I don't concern myself with things that troubles me or takes away my time and my energy and my attention and then verse 2 is the key and surely I have calm and quieted my soul like a wind child this is how you ascend to the throne room like a wind child with his mother like a wind child, he says, is my soul within me. Now, a wind child, in the biblical perspective from the Hebrew culture, is a child about two years old, a, 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 you know, a, a baby that is wind at his mother's bosom. And have you ever seen, and I'm sure you have, a small little baby drinking milk from the mother's breast and as the baby drinks and as the baby drinks and drinks and suckle on, on the nipple of the mother's breast and the baby will just 
sometimes open the eyes and see the loving assurance of the mother looking back at the baby. And the baby will feel so secure, so comfortable, so at rest because the baby was at the right place receiving the right nourishment. That's what a wind child is. That is the secret to engage God. What do I mean? Hear these people. Are you satisfied with Him? Are you satisfied with God? Like a wind child. Are you satisfied with His nourishment, His presence? Are you secure in His presence? Are you resting in His presence? That is what a wind child is. And when you are like a wind child and you have quieted your soul, because the soul or here inside of you is the seat of your emotion, is the seat of your soul and your spirit. This is where the Holy Spirit sits. And this is where He holds your hand and He takes you to the other dimension. So when you quiet your soul, you are receiving. Receiving. You are receiving You are receiving And as you are receiving You are ascending You are ascending Because you are engaging with God Like a weaned child Rested in the presence Receiving his nourishment In his presence And it's who you are Lord you are the El Shaddai. Once upon a time, a Jewish rabbi taught this, and I was so amazed by what this rabbi said about the true meaning of El Shaddai. You know, our mainline theology tells us El Shaddai means the all sufficient one, the great and mighty one. Yes, he's all sufficient, but the true meaning. Of Shaddai means many breasted one. Hello. He is a father that has so much nourishment. And this is a metaphorical image, right? God doesn't have many breasts, don't get me wrong. This is a metaphorical expression of the father with so many breasts running with milk. For his children to come and drink from him That is why he's called El Shaddai The many-breasted one And like a wind child We come before him To receive And as we receive Inside here We ascend Inside To the other dimension And Father I pray Lord I pray you teach The church this that you help them to experience this That you are able to quiet your soul You are able to shift from here to here <sighs> And tonight Lord, we just want to rest at your feet Just like Bethany Jesus found friends in Bethany. This is where you found friends, Lord. This is your Bethany. Tonight we want to engage with you. Tonight we want to sit at your feet and receive from you. Tonight we want to go higher, we want to go deeper. And not just for tonight, but every day of our life, Lord, you have called us. To step into the resurrection glory You have called us to step up To upgrade ourselves To go higher and deeper and So Lord, help us to understand How to quiet our soul And how to ascend One more time Tiara with the chorus is who you are. Just minister to the Lord. Just minister to Him. We have a busy week. Sometimes we get so preoccupied with so many things. 
But one thing God requires from you and I is to be a wind child tonight, to rest at the bosom of El Shaddai. It's who you are. Oh, we receive your presence inside. Your milk and your honey. Glory. Hallelujah. Glory to your name, Lord. You are who you are. And you make us who we are because of you. And by your grace, we are who we are. Just as you are who you are. Father and Son. Bless your holy name, Lord. Holy Spirit, we welcome again your teaching tonight, your counsel, your enlightenment, wisdom and revelation comes from you, Lord. And we give you praise. We give you honor and glory for that. In Jesus' precious name, Amen and Amen. Hallelujah. Wonderful Jesus. Someone asked me, who is going to win the American election? Donald Duck. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. Wonderful Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God Almighty. And like I mentioned, if you miss it, last week I prophesied this and I said that there will be a lot of civil unrest and, you know, rioting and lawlessness and violence that's going to take place. And we are going to see that happening in America because of dissatisfaction. I gave that word very clearly last week. Dissatisfaction that is going to cause civil unrest in the States. So keep America in prayer. Pray that God will protect the innocent, and God will protect His people and the churches. Hallelujah. Glory to His name. But nevertheless, at the end of the day, His will will be done. Wonderful Jesus. Praise God. Let us be more concerned about our parliament. Because the same thing is about to happen here too if the church don't pray. Hallelujah. So Lord, we thank you again as a governmental church. We bring America, we also bring Malaysia into your hands. And we say, Lord, your sovereign will will stand and prevail against all the schemes of man and the plots of the evil one. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, praise God, wonderful Jesus. As I promised last Thursday, we're going to start today's session with a question and answers. Okay? 
Hallelujah. And sometimes your question may be the question that someone else is also asking, but because they are too shy to, to take the mic and ask the question, so you are bold. <laughs> And you have something stirring and you need to ask. And, and so, please do take the mic, okay, when I give you the signal to do so. And come and ask questions that is related, related to the Word of God. Related to the spiritual Okay, related to our faith, to Christian growth and maturity and what you have learned in module one or what you have learned in the last few weeks or months. Okay, please don't come and ask me, Pastor, am I going to, who am I going to marry? Is it Tom, Dick or Harry? <laughs> uh, I'm not a fortune teller, all right? <laughs> Hallelujah. So don't ask me questions that are irrelevant. Hallelujah. Praise God. So, we're going to have a Q&A and we want to welcome the, the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. I'm going to just uh, relax myself for a while and just let the Lord speak to us today. Lord, you, you take the chair. So, questions. You have a question, just come, take the mic. Because we have an Old Testament overview and perspective. We're going to go into the Old Testament today, all right? So we, we don't have much time. So any questions that you want to ask, please do come quick and take the mic. And these are going to bless the whole body and those who are listening as well, right? Um, and sometimes, remember this, you don't have to be embarrassed to ask questions because sometimes the question is not just to benefit you, but it benefits everyone else. You get that? Uh, you're all still alive here. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. So anyone have any questions that you want to ask? Come. Don't be shy. You have to take the mic so that it's, it's, it can be heard by all the rest of the and those who are watching us. Uh, come and take the mic. Don't be shy. This will bless, this will benefit the body of Christ. Hallelujah. Turn it on, please. Sound check. One of the sisters is asking, how come when they enter the ark, because we don't know the colors of uh, skin colors of those people who entered the ark, how come nowadays we have so many different colors? If they are just one family, so she is thinking that those people who entered the ark, they only have one skin color. But how come now we have so many colors? Could you please explain why? Maybe you should become my representative and then you will go around and those who have answered questions, you will, you will, you know. But maybe they are afraid to come up here. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You can, you can take a seat there first, okay? Hallelujah. Wonderful Jesus. Biologically speaking, there is a gene, uh, there is what is called in scientific or medically, there is called AIG1 genes, where in chromosome number six, you have chromosomes in your body. So in chromosome six in the body, this AIG1 genes is able to carry, I don't want to use the word mutation, but that's what it actually is, right? It, it causes a, 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 a hybrid change, if I would say it that way. Uh, mutation maybe is, you know, doesn't sound so good. I thought you think we are teenage mutant ninjas. Or what. So this, this chromosome 6 of the AIG1 genes in our body, right? It, it carries that, and when, when children are born, they tend to follow what is in that chromosome of the parents, okay? And 
That is the reason why many scholars believe that after the flood, because of the AIG1 genes in the wife of Ham, and her name is not Bacon, right? In the wife of Ham, that uh, she gave birth to the Cushites because the Cushites were dark skinned people. Okay? So. Shem, the other son, is olive skin, more like the Mediterranean. And then you have Japheth, who is white. So you have white, you have olive, and you have dark skin in the sons of Noah itself. Okay? So from, from that, it was believed by many scholars that as they start to scatter over the, the globe, the planet, and those who go to stay in the colder climate area, like in the northern hemisphere, right, in colder climate area, and because of the adaptation of pigmentation, you see, our skin has melanins, right? And that's what our pigmentation are made up of. And, and because of that, when you, when you live in a, a, a colder climate, okay, where you don't have so much sun, now that causes, again, an adaptation of the pigmentation of the skin. And those who scattered or migrated to the hotter climate area, and because of the sunlight, the intense sunlight in those areas, the skin tends to develop more melanin or pigmentation. Okay? So that's why you see it even today that in hotter climate, tropical countries, you tend to have darker skinned people. Right? Whereas in colder climate, you tend to have the fairer skinned people. But of course today, because of globalization, people migrate, so it's all mixed up like a big roja. Right? But back in those days, it was caused by a climate, it was caused by adaptation, it was also caused by the, the genes factor of the chromosomes in, in the body of people. And I... I also believe I also believe that uh, the Lord designed it in that way because nothing happened without God's design. I also believe that God designed it in that way because God loves colors. Hello. He created different colors, you know. So I think God doesn't just want his children to have only one skin color, you know. He, he wants us to have different skin color. Hallelujah. But we are all the same color in Christ. Amen. Are you hearing this? We are all the same in Christ. Because if you would skin your skin away, you know, peel all the skin, you only have one color. It's the color of flesh. Am I right? It's the color of flesh. So again, because of the adaptation to climates, the migration, and again, the, the, the evolvement of, of the genes and the chromosomes, especially with the AI gene, one genes, okay, that causes uh, genes or causes the people to have different, even facial appearances and skin color and so on, right? So I, I pray that that will answer your, pray, your, your question. And again, like I say, I believe that God loves diversity, right? God loves all kinds of people, every tribe with every different, you know, diverse uh, representation in his kingdom. Okay, second question. Second question. They want to find out the definite size of this qubit. 
because his concern is that during those, those times, because cubic depends on people's arms, right? So if you are bigger, the cubit size will be longer. If you are shorter like me, the cubit will also be shorter. So the question now is that, what is the definite size of cubit during those time? So it means that if based on the measurement, our measurement now will be totally different. Could you please um, give uh, some explanation on how you could meet this uh, question from our... It's very simple because they take the measurement on the average size okay, of um, grown-up adult male where from the elbow to the tip of the finger, it is called a standard cubit. And the standard cubit is actually 17.5 inches, or some may say 18 inches, okay? Then you have the measuring the long cubit, which is 20.4 cubit. And long measuring cubits are for measuring, like I say, construction, measuring land, the land mass, the length, the length of a land, okay? Measuring distance and so on. So when you measure distance, you measure a building, you measure a construction or whatever, you, they use the long cubit. Now, it becomes standardized. So they, they make it into what is called a measuring rod. So they have like a yardstick. You know, today you, you go to a tailor shop, there is a yardstick and you know that that one yard is three feet, right? So they already make it standardized. They have a, a cubit stick or a cubit yardstick for measurement. So regardless of whether the constructor or the construction worker is, is tall or short, small or big, they already have a standard measuring rod for that. So standard cubit for measuring male or for measuring small furnitures and all that, they use the standard of 17.5 inches. But for measuring like the arc or construction or distance, they use the 20.4, which is called the long cubit. Okay? They have a measuring rod that is already standardized for that. So they don't make any mistake. Because when they build, they know that it is the exact length or depth or width of a measurement. Okay, third question. Pastor, I want to check. Um, in Genesis 7, they are the clean and unclean animals. Um, what are the clean and unclean animals? Hallelujah. All right. Now, why, why is it, first of all, God used the term clean and unclean why did he use the term okay he wants to draw a boundary he wants to draw a distinction between his people israel and the pagans of the land the heathen okay so in those days the the heathen or the pagan people they eat all kinds of animals, anything that crawl, anything that walk, they eat them, right? So they eat all kinds of animals, especially with the blood in it, right? So they, they drank blood as well with the animal. And like I say, I believe this came from the distorted uh, teachings that the fallen angels taught or corrupted man with. And it's a very, uh, I would say, common thing in ancient uh, Babylonian culture or Mesopotamian culture where they drink blood of animals and, and it's, it's like a ritual. They eat all kinds of... And which is why when Daniel went to Babylon, he had to eat vegetables. That's called kosher food, okay? Halal, in a, in a sense. So he had to eat food that is not prepared according to the culture of the pagan people and also to make sure that there is no blood. And even in the, in the New Testament, it was mentioned 
when they start to convert the Greeks and the Romans, the only con- the only doctor, or I would say the only observation from Jewish law that the apostles taught is that they must not eat blood, they must not sacrifice to idols, and that is this uh, one of the mandate that was given by the Jerusalem Council. Now, coming back to why unclean and clean animals, God wants to draw a distinction. God wants his people to understand what is holy, what is profound. And I also believe in this, God doesn't want Israel to follow the pattern of the pagan, to intermingle with the pagan people because, you know, when you, when you intermingle or intermarry with people of other faith, other culture, and you start to eat what they eat, you know, get what I'm saying? And then you'll be eating a lot of animals with blood in it. So that's why there is a distinction of what is clean and what is unclean. And it is, I believe, one of God's way to indoctrinate Israel, to observe what is holy, what is right, and also to keep them or to refrain them from having all kinds of uh, carnal indulgence in everything that the pagan people practice. Now, why are demons called unclean spirit? All right, have you ever thought about that? Now, the word unclean, the word unclean in the Hebraic culture means from the wilderness, outcasts. Okay, so in English we use the word unclean. We think it's because we didn't put it in the tap water, didn't wash it, that's why it's unclean. No, no, in the Hebrew understanding, Unclean means from the wilderness, outcast, one that is despised. Which is why in Leviticus, I think in chapter 16, you know, there is a scapegoat where they had to transfer the sin of the nation on the scapegoat and they would chase the scapegoat out of the wilderness and they will go to this place where it is called unclean. Why? Outcast, and they, they will send the scapegoat all the sin to Azazel, which is another name for Lucifer or Satan. And they believe that the sin that God has cleansed, God has forgiven, are now being removed to the outer courts or the outcast, the wilderness, which is why Jesus himself was also tempted in the wilderness. But there's a long story there. But come back to this. Unclean and clean is one of God's definition to safeguard Israel from compromising with the pagan culture, from intermingling with pagans, okay, with the people of the, of the culture of the land, and to teach Israel to observe what is holy, what is, what is profane, and also to, I believe, uh, teach Israel to obey, to have just simple obedience in observing what God has already mandated or ordained for them. Hallelujah. I hope that answers most of your questions. Pastor has a follow-up question. Where are you? Okay. I'm here now. (laughs) (laughs) With these unclean and clean animals, uh, we have these crabs, prawns. These are unclean animals, correct? But uh, someone is asking, because someone is asking nowadays, people are, they love to eat crabs, they love to eat prawns. Could you please give an advice? Why is it that the Bible says that we can't eat these? But uh, she also added that all things can be eaten <laughs> are good. But then we have all these things that cannot be eaten. Please elaborate more on it. Thank you very much. If you will look at First Timothy, First Timothy, let's go to chapter four. Now, as New Testament believers, God gave us a whole a different game plan, if I will use the word. 
The reason why in the Old Testament I say is that there must be a distinction between clean and unclean is because God wants to separate his people from the pagan, to draw a distinction, that they will not follow and compromise with the pagan people, the culture of the pagan, the heathen, because most of the religious uh, observation, most of the practices, even the food that the pagans partake in those times are all demonic. That's why God wants to separate them in the Old Testament. But now, Christ came, Christ died for us, he has already given us the Holy Spirit. We have God's Holy Spirit abiding in us. He's our teacher. And look at First Timothy and chapter 4. And let's see this word here. In verse 3. Maybe we start with verse 1 so that you can see the context. First Timothy and chapter 4 and... Verse 1, the Spirit, Holy Spirit here, right, expressly says that in latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. And verse 2, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their own conscience sealed with a hot iron. Verse 3, Forbidding to marry, you see, there are, there are some religious cults, even denominations in the body of Christ that forbid people to marry, especially the priests, right? You get what I'm saying? Commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. And look at verse 4. For every creature of God, you see that? So that includes your swine. <laughs> if you like to eat roast pork, all right? That includes anything. That's why now we are given a commandment. Every creature, okay, this speaks about all the animals of God, is good. Nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving. You know, Jesus never prayed for food, one, you know. I do not know why or where we churches today uh, get this teaching, uh, Lord, let's pray for the food. Before you eat, say grace, pray for the food. You don't pray for the food, you give thanks for the food. Do you get that? When Jesus broke the bread, the, the, the Latin or Vulgate translation say Eucharist. He give thanks. That's why we get the word for the communion today. The Eucharist of Christ, of Christo. Eucharist de Christo. Okay? Now, every food that we eat, when you give thanks, it is sanctified. There was one time in the food court I eat before without praying, somebody rebuked me. Hey, Pastor, you didn't say grace. Uh. I said, I don't have to say grace. I am grace already. <laughs> it's sanctified. <laughs> that, you know, Christ in us, Christ in us, the hope of glory, and we know that when we eat, we give thanks to God. I thank you for the food. I eat it. It is sanctified. Which is why it says that when you even drink Poison, if you preach the gospel in Mark 16, it will not harm you. Missionaries have gone to many places. We had to eat biawa, you know, in the jungles. Some had to eat snakes. Why? That's the food of the tribal people. But as missionaries, we don't go there and say, oh, you're eating snake. I, I better cook my own sausage. <laughs> You know, we, we had, this is, this is part of the mission, mission school. We partake of what they serve. You know, and, and whatever it is, sometimes when I go on mission, I don't ask them what they are cooking. Because you don't want to know. <laughs> you, right? So you just give thanks for the food, you partake of it. It is sanctified. Because the Bible says, every creature of God is good. But look at verse 3. Some teaches that you must abstain. You cannot eat meat, you cannot eat seafood, you cannot eat this, cannot eat that. But the Bible is very clear. Every creature is good. 
God man eat for food. The only requirement that God have is don't have blood in it. So remember, yes, I'm going to say that. When you go and eat karimi, no tuhoi. Okay, no blood. Because we are not allowed to eat blood. Life is in the blood, and, and blood is sacred, and blood is used, I say, in, 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 in many traditional beliefs for witchcraft and all kinds of demonic practices. So God made it very clear. Even the, 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 the nice sin, what is nice sin? The nice sin is where the apostles have another a doctrinal constitution. It's called the, 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 the nice sin mandate. says that very clearly. That we are not to eat any food with blood in it. So no pork blood or chicken blood or whatever, you know. But any food, it is sanctified. Give thanks, it is sanctified. Amen? Can you give her the mic, please? <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> they mix the they mix blood it in, clot the, in, in, in the, the in the soup. Yeah, in the soup, but they remove the blood clot. clot. Can they eat it? <laughs> Good question. Hallelujah. I think if you look at First Corinthians chapter eight and First Corinthians chapter ten, Paul even spoke about food. Okay to the church in Corinth because in Corinth most of the meat that was sold in the market were dedicated to idols you know and many Christians they, they, they will go to the market and they will buy the food and they do not know they don't go around and ask have you dedicated this to Apollo in the temple they don't ask that so they just buy the food and they go back and they give thanks it is sanctified and and Paul made that very clear that if our, hear this, if our conscience do not condemn us, you get it? If your conscience don't condemn you, all things is permissible. That's in the Bible, right? In chapter 8 and chapter 10, you can go back and read on that. If your conscience do not condemn you, and you know that you know Christ in you is greater, he that is in me is greater, that's why I can go to temples. Not to go and pray, but to go and, you know, reach out to people. Because I know Christ in me is greater than all those idols, all right? So if you know that whatever you do, it doesn't condemn you, your conscience don't condemn you, then it is fine. But if you would go and eat the curry meat and then you say, oh, the, the soup got, got blood, and then you feel so guilty, then I would say, no, don't let that be a stumbling block. Lah. Then better not eat curry meat, lah. Just each hakwete will do. <laughs> Coming back to the ham, right? Now, these are seafood. Okay, these are seafood. But but make sure that it is cooked properly, that there's no blood in it. You know? Yeah. So you can eat seafood and all that, okay? Hallelujah. You're talking about food, you're making me hungry now. Can we can we can we talk about something? Any more questions, please? Steak half done, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. Pastor. Medium rare. <laughs> I, I would say that, you know, sometimes you see, um, even when you go to KFC, you, you buy a fried chicken and at the bone, sometimes you can still see the, you know, you see, we, we, we don't have to be so extreme where, oh, a little bit of blood there in the chicken I cannot eat, must throw away, then go and vomit everything out, you know? We don't know, because the Bible says you don't purposely go and eat blood. You don't purposely do it. But if there are some elements, because, you know, it's in the, it's in the cooking and all that, I think that does not seal our conscience, that does not make us guilty. Lah, huh? Okay, yes. Uh, thank you, Pastor. Uh, regarding the flood, God said he clean, cleansed the whole earth and left only four couples. So that means it was intended to remove the Nephilim, right? 
but why uh, on removing, killing all the Nephilims, there are spirits around, are they released? Number one. Number two, why when the Israelites went back to the promised land, did uh, the, all the spies said that they look like giants, they're the Anaks, you know? So, are they related to the Nephilim or are they from the tribe of one of the four couples? Okay, now, we know that because of the, the mutation that happened for about the 300 period before the flood came, and, you know, the, the, it's like the whole human race have been defiled by all these, you know, intermarriages and, and lawlessness and wickedness and all that and witchcraft. It's not just only about the Nephilim, but it's also about how the fallen ones, the fallen angels came to indoctrinate the, the known world at that time with witchcraft, with all kinds of demonic rituals and practices and, and even even bestiality, having sex with animals, and so it is all written in ancient Mesopotamian texts, you know. Now, I believe that it's the mercy of God because when he said in Genesis 6, he said he saw the wickedness and the evil of man. It is so evil, it's so bad that God was even grieved that he created them. And it's the mercy of God that he would, he would save Noah and his family, you know, and with these four couples that he can start again. That's why he told Noah, replenish the earth again. Asa, re-establish the earth again. And then, when you come to the promised land in Canaan, like I said, the scholars believe this, that there is one of the, the Kushites, because they trace the, the Anakims, they trace the, the Rephidims, okay, and, and they trace them, and even Zanzumim, another word for the giants. So they trace them to uh, people coming from northern part of Africa today, which is where the Kushites went to. So they trace it from there, and so they believe that it is from the lineage of Ham that one of these, uh, you know, these uh, these tribes of giants came from. Now, if you will look at Goliath, okay, again the, the measurement of this man is about ten feet, nine and a half feet tall. But look at the other king, King Ok for example, which is one of the king of uh, the Anakim, his bed, you know, his bed is 13 and a half feet long, you know, the, f the bed. So, you know, maybe he wants to stretch his hand a bit, stretch his leg, you know, so he, he would be at least 10, 11 feet tall if his bed is 13 and a half feet long, right? So again, they, they trace this and they believe that, because there are two theories here. One is, did the watchers came down and mutate the human genes again? And there are many debates about this, but many agree that it cannot be because God wouldn't allow that to happen again. Because there's an ancient uh, teaching that says that after... After the flood, there were some watchers who also left their abode and came down. And again, they, they mutated. That's why you have the giants, which is one of the reasons why God commanded Joshua when he entered the promised land to slay the giants, to, to slay out all these wicked tribes, you know. And David was commanded to slay Goliath, and not only Goliath, later on the four brothers of Goliath too, to completely wipe out the giants, you know. Perhaps there was a mutation there. But then there are also another scam of scholars who believe that that this was, like say, the AIG-1 uh, genes that is being passed on from one of from Ham's wife. Ham's wife could be a third-generation hybrid, meaning that 
her great grandparents may be one of those that had the relationship with one of the fallen ones, and she carried that in her genes. And after the flood, that gene starts to again, you know, evolve itself, and it was uh, released. And there was this tribe of giants who came. So there are two schools or camps of theological thoughts concerning this. Okay, so pastor, uh, so. Uh, when we die, our souls return to God. When these demigods, Nephilims die, where do their souls go? Number one. Number two, where do demons come from? Even Hallelujah. You are going to have a demonology, you know. <laughs> Hallelujah. At the beginning, topic, feature topic of module three, feature topic on angels and, and demons. Okay, now... You see, the Nephilims, all right, are the produce of celestial beings, fallen angels, and human women. Now, when they, like I say, when they came into being and they birthed out these Nephilims, and these Nephilims are, like I say, they are hybrid, they are, they are half celestial, half terrestrial. And uh, that's why they are like giants and so on. And we do not how, know how they look like. Some even say that they have more fingers and toes. That's why there are also some today that have, you know, six fingers and six toes. But again, that's all part of the, the chromosome defects of humans. I, we have doctors here. You understand what I'm saying. Now, I, I believe, I believe in this, and again, you look at the theology in the Bible, we just give you a prelude on demons here. Demons are called unclean spirit, they are called disembodied spirit. It means that they don't have a body, okay? They don't have a body, that's why they are called disembodied. That's why they look around for the body. That's why when Jesus cast out the demons, the legions, now, you may be surprised because Maidenine theology teaches us, oh, legions means 600 to 2,000. But do you know that legions in Aramaic means we are the giants, warriors? So even the demons are confessing that they are the Nephilims. We are the warriors. We are the legions, you know? So now, coming back to this, this em when Jesus cast out the demons, they said, you know, don't let us go to the dry places. That is again unclean wilderness. That's the meaning in Hebrew, unclean places, the dry places. And they, they say, rather, let us go into the peaks. Remember that? They, they entered 2,000 peaks. Why? Because they are disembodied spirits. They are looking for a body. I have seen a demonized dog, you know. Oh, yes. This was, I could, God know where was it? <laughs> Somewhere else, I can't remember where, in another country. I was, I was, you know, being intimidated by this dog and it's a real terrier and it's like, you know, and I look at that and I see that there's demons in that dog, you know, and I commanded that dog to be still in Jesus' name. That dog was about to bite me. And when I commanded the dog, the dog said, and just ran away. So you see, there is demon. Demons can, can demonize animals. Okay? Now, would an angel degrade himself to go and inhabit a pig? They don't do that. Because angels, even though they are fallen, they still have celestial bodies. They are not disembodied. Okay, so only the demons are disembodied. So the theology goes in the book of Enoch, where Enoch wrote about it. The book of Jasher also wrote about this. Then these are again credible uh, books that were, you know, were, were widely read by Second Temple era believers. What Second Temple era? The time when Jesus walked the earth, the second temple that Herod built, right? So they were, they were all these people that, that believe in this, even the, the Essenes. Who are the Essenes? The one who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls. 
in Qumran, the Essenes, they also wrote about this. They, they, these are literatures that were widely accepted back in those days. Their worldview is different. So they say that these demons are the result of the flood that came because before the flood, there was no mention of demons and nothing in the Bible. So after the flood, when the flood came, the Nephilim, of course, they drowned. They drowned in the flood, right? God changed, according to 2 Peter chapter 2 and the book of Jude, God changed these fallen angels in Tartarus, but God did not change the Nephilim, right? It says only the fallen angels. So what about these Nephilim? So when the flood came, obviously they died. So when they died, where did their spirit go to? Because these are the spirit of fallen angels. You get what I'm saying? So that's why they are called the children of fallen angels. Demons are the offsprings of these fallen ones. They are the, the disembodied spirits. And that's the reason why they want to possess humans. They want to find bodies. And in many in many other ancient literatures, these, these demons would refer to Satan as father. They would, they would refer to the fallen angels as their fathers. Okay? So they are the offsprings. That that's where they, they, they come from. But we will have more in-depth and detailed study on this when we talk about angels and, and demons in our feature topic. Okay, one last question. Give her the mic, please, so that, she is, uh, so that those who are viewing us can also hear, right? Uh, what happens if you are cutting something and you happen to cut your own hand, uh, your finger and then it, start, it starts to bleed? So, I see a friend of mine doing, he quickly take the head, I mean the finger, and she sucked the blood, it's her own blood. Is it okay to take your own blood? <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Doctor, is it okay to drink your own blood? <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, you see, again, you, you know, in everything that we do, in everything that we do, it is always, you know, decided by our motive and our intention, you know. Are we drinking the blood because purposely we want to drink the blood? Because it's a motive, you know, you get what I'm saying? But if we are, if we saw, you know, oh, blood coming out from my finger and, you know, automatic our reaction, oh, you know, sayang, the one with blood too, you know. So, you see, remember this, remember this. In, in all things, all right, we are accountable to God for our motives behind our action. Because if we do something that is wrong out of ignorance, okay, God doesn't judge us for that because we do not know. He wouldn't judge us for doing something that we do not know is wrong. But once we know it is wrong and we purposely want to do it, then, you know, we are accountable to God. So when you come to questions like this, you know, if you cut yourself and you bleed, you know, should you let the blood flow or, you know, or should you hold it or should you, you know, I think even if you taste a little bit, you know, there's no judgment there. Lah, huh? I think the God understands there's grace there, you know. And this, is, this has nothing to do, with, because you see, the abstinence from eating blood and drinking blood, what is the motive behind it? The motive is that God's people will not compromise and follow pagan cultures or follow the pagan matters. And we don't purposely go and eat or drink those blood, you know? So, but if, like you say, you cut yourself and all that, you know, so what? Now, for example, what if you have a bruise in your gums, right? And you bleed in the gum. So what should you do? Should you swallow the blood or spit it out? You know, so the same question again. You get what I'm saying? So I think with that, it is fine. Lah. Okay, one last one, Ridia. Huh? We got to go. It, uh, 
I, I put two questions in one. Um, why Noah's children and not his father, the Noah's father? Why didn't he bring him into the ark? Lamak, not yeah. Enoch, Lamak. Noah's father is Lamak. Ah, Enoch why? is a few other... Oh, no, why not? Why not Lamak? Why he didn't, why God didn't ask Lama to go in or why didn't Noah bring Lama in? That's the first question. Number two, what's the significance? After a very bright thing, you know, God bless Noah, they came. Why the vineyard story? Why suddenly show Noah being naked? What's the point of that uh, passage? Hallelujah. Now, scholars who drew the timeline, uh, I, I also have it in my Bible here, who drew the timeline, shows that Lamech was very old already when the flood came. He was very old already, right? I'm not sure his age, what was his age, but he was already very old. Can you imagine Noah is already 600 years old when the flood came? So Lamech could be way past seven, 800 years old. I, I, I have to refer to my Bible to see the exact figure. So he was very old already. Now, we don't have all the answers given in the Bible why. You know, so when we come to certain things like this, we can only speculate. Lah, huh? We can only speculate. I, I, I believe that Lamech is righteous. I, I believe that because, uh, you know, he is the one who brought up Noah to be righteous, you know. And Lamech parents were righteous. They were the righteous lineage of Shem. Uh, sorry, of Seth, not Shem. Uh, so I believe he's righteous, but why, why is it that, that God didn't include him in the ark? Now, we can speculate. Perhaps Lamech's wife already passed away, right? Perhaps, you know, because God wants to preserve couples that can procreate. Right, God wants uh, couples that are able to again, you know, repopulate the earth. Okay, or in a sense, uh, couples who are still sexually active. So maybe Lamech already too old, not active anymore. All right. So there could be many speculation, or perhaps he don't no longer have a wife. All right. So that we we cannot answer what is the real reason but do ask jesus when you see him next time all right <laughs> hallelujah now the vineyard well noah was a construct a construction worker who constructed the ark and we know that he must have some kind of construction skills maybe in those days People are, are multi-talented. They know how to do this. They know how to build houses, how to plant vineyards. They are multi-talented because people need that for survival. And Noah, when he came out, we, the Bible says he became a farmer. I believe there was nothing much to build. Maybe he was also too old already, so let the sons build. So he, be, he was a farmer and he tended a vineyard. And uh, hallelujah, I, I also see that as a prophetic relevance, okay, that, uh, you know, when, when, because Noah again represents Christ in the Bible, it's a prototype of Christ, because in the New Covenant, everything is now renewed, it's reestablished again, and Christ also planted a vineyard called the church. All right, in the prophetic relevance, that's why Noah planted a vineyard. There's a prophetic significance to that. But of course, in the natural, the Noah planted a vineyard. And uh, I, I believe that when you plant vineyard, you also want to taste the produce of your fruit. So he got too much of that and he got drunk. And uh, then we know that when the son found him, he was naked, right? 
Now, I believe that nothing happened by chance or accident in the Bible. Everything, you know, there's no such thing as coincidence or by chance. Everything in the Bible is orchestrated. God allows human to have free will. But at the end of the day, even though when we mess up, God turned our evil around for good. You see, for example, Isaac cheated on, you know, the, the brother, right, with Rebecca, and God turned it around for good. Then later on, you have Jacob and Esau. Again, you know, Jacob, a deceiver, and, you know, again, you know, a conspiracy with the mother to cheat on the, the inheritance. Lies was involved, conspiracy was involved, you know, but yet God turned that around to make it his covenant blessing, you know. So everything happened for a reason. And I believe that out of that incident, God chose that as a platform to release a greater blessing on the lineage of Shem and Japheth, where Ham who mock the father nakedness, all right, receive an admonition, and some may call it a curse. And the Bible says that Ham, you are now going to serve bacon. <laughs> Hallelujah. You are now going to serve Shem and Japheth the rest of your days. And some, some may even see that significance where in the slave trade, you know, in the slave trade, because remember, Ham, we are talking about the Kushites, the, the Africans here, right? And you can see that in the, they, they saw that, that uh, prophecy being fulfilled when the slave trade happens, when back in those days, the white men would go and bring all these African slaves to, to, to serve them. And so they saw the fulfillment of that curse on Ham, right? Hallelujah. Okay, maybe we have to... Uh, is it? So he died five years, but he was very much alive when Noah built. Oh, you had to you had to read it in the way where you had to understand this, where it says uh, he lived five nine five years after he begot. That means after Noah was born. Now Lamech didn't give birth to Noah when he was zero years old, you know. Right? So Lamech could be a hundred years old. Uh, so if you if you add one hundred years over plus five nine five, okay. If it says in that way, that means that means he passed away before the flood came, but he was still alive when Noah built the ark. That is what I'm trying to say. He is still alive. He knew it. He saw it. He, he knew everything. So that answers the question. All right? Hallelujah. So shall we continue with our Old Testament? And if you have any other questions, maybe next time we will go into that. All right? Hallelujah. Thank you. Holy Spirit. Aligato. Okay. Let's go to the slides quickly. Wonderful Lord God Almighty. The Old Testament. So today we're going to do an overview. An overview and a perspective on the Old Testament. The Old Testament is a very interesting book. And I wrote that in your notes. I say it shouldn't be called the old 
Testament, it should be called the First Testament. Because old means outdated, you know. So Old Testament is not outdated. Let me just put it this way. Uh, some people asked me once, he said, uh, Pastor, if Old Testament is old, well, why do we still want to read the Old Testament? Why don't we just tear the Old Testament out from the Bible, just make do with the New Testament, right? Now, the Old Testament, the Old Testament is our foundation, is a prophetic prototype. That's why in your book here, you will see that in every book in the Old Testament, Christ is revealed in the book. And, and Jesus also made it very clear where he says in Romans 3.31, let's go there quickly, Romans 3.31, where it says here, do we then make void the law? Do we make void means nullify it? Do we abandon it? Do we neglect it? Do we tear it out from our Bible? The law, the Old Testament, do we do that? Romans 3.31, and it says, Certainly not, but on the contrary, we establish the law. So the, the New Testament is an establishment of the Old Testament. The New Testament is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. So that's why the Old Testament is very important. The Old Testament is our foundation. It is a beautiful story of redemption and restoration and reconciliation that reads to the that leads to the revealing of Jesus. Okay? So let's come to this. Old Testament. Let's go back to the slides. As you can see, there are a lot of uh, characters in, in the Old Testament that are very interesting, intriguing. You know, I love the stories in the Old Testament. They speak so much about God's people and their walk and their journey. So we have the five sections in the Old Testament. The first one is called the Pentateuch or the Book of Five, compilation of five. That's what it means, Pentateuch, all right? It is, it is uh, in the Hebrew, it's called the Torah. So you have Genesis, you have Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, which are the five books of the Torah or the Pentateuch. Then you have the historical books, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, 2nd Kings, 1st, 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. Why are they classified as historical books? Because they reveal a lot about the formation of Israel as a nation, the uh, historical records of the people, the struggles, the battles, the victories, the conquests, the enemies that they overcome, and their journey of redemption and restoration. So that's why they are considered as historical books. Then after that, you have the poetic book. You can also say that they are the prophetic books. God, every word of God is prophetic. Most of it are prophetic. Of course, there are facts and history and all that. Now, the poetic books are the book of Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. The reason why they are called poetic books is because there are a lot of poetic literatures uh, symbolic literatures, metaphorical expression in their languages, and uh, uh, what is also called a riddle or proverbs in those passages. Okay? So that's why they are called poetic books. Then after that, you have the major prophets. 
Why are they called major prophets? Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. Of course, uh, Jeremiah also wrote the little book called Lamentation. Why are these four called major prophets? The reason is because they wrote big portions in the Old Testament. If you read all these books, they are, you know, big volumes of it. So they wrote big portions. And again, it's not only about the, the volumes that they wrote, but about the, the greater or the parts that they play, major parts that they play, which are integral in Israel history, which is why they are called the major prophets. And then you have the minor prophets. Minor doesn't mean they are small or they are little, or they are insignificant. But the reason why theologians classify them as minor is because they write smaller portion right, in, in, the, in the Bible. And some of the books that are really short are like Obadiah and Nahum and Zephaniah. Okay, so they only wrote a little bit and they are not that significant in the history of Israel. Now we can view we can view the Old Testament from these five different oh sorry, four different view okay and the first one is called a synthetic view of the old testament where you you read it as a whole as a general message as big general storyline and you can read it in that way and i encourage people to do that glory to god I started reading Genesis when I was six years old. Glory to God. Six years old. I love to read, right? <laughs> so when I was six years old, I started reading Genesis. And uh, I believe by seven or, or eight, you know, of course I don't understand everything, but I just, I can understand the story. I enjoy the story. I enjoy the story of Moses. I enjoy, of course, Joseph's story in Genesis. So I started reading, you know, as young as six, seven years old. And I like it even though I don't understand everything but I enjoy the story. So that's called synthetic reading, where you read it as a story, where you enjoy the storyline. You know, so you can read it like a novel. Uh, I, have a, I have a Bible uh, in, my, in, my, in my home that was written by one of the top... Nobel Prize winner and also one of the top authors who actually wrote novels, okay? And he converted the Bible into a story. And this was written 20 over years ago. It's not the message, okay? It's, it's, a, it's a whole story. So when you read it, it's like you are reading a novel from Genesis onwards. So it's beautiful, you know? Thick book. <laughs> Hallelujah. So that's called synthetic reading. of Read it as an, a whole general view of the Bible, as a storyline to, to give you an understanding of the lives of all those characters. I'm hearing something. Give me a minute. Lord just want me to say this to you. Every character from Abraham, even from Adam onwards, okay, from, from Abraham, Noah, of course, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, you know, then you have Moses, you have Elijah, you have, of course, Joshua, you have Daniel, you know, all those characters in the Old Testament. The Lord just said this to me to remind you. Every character is a prototype of the church today. 
meaning that every character, for example, you have heard many terminologies, oh, we are the Joshua generation, you know, oh, we are the Elijah generation. We are also the Moses generation, you know. We are called to deliver the world out of bondage. We are called to confront governments. We are called to bring people to encounter God. You know, we are called to establish God's law. So we are also a Moses generation. We are also a Daniel generation serving in pagan governments for those Christian politicians. So every character in the Old Testament serves as a prophetic prototype of the New Testament church. Which is why it's so important that, that we read the characters and we study the characters to understand our roles as a church today in the New Testament. You get that? Thank you for that, Lord. Then you have another view. It's called the analytical view, right? And this is the process of viewing the books and the chapters verse by verse to get in-depth understanding. So these are for the serious scholars. And you can go to the etymology of the word in the Hebrew. Uh, let me just say this. Most part of the Old Testament are written in Hebrew. Using ancient Hebrew, and maybe one day I'll teach on this because ancient Hebrew don't have vowels. So in the 17th century, they, the rabbis add, starts to add on vowels into the Hebrew or the Semitic language. And which is why that in some way alter a meaning. Not the translation, but it can alter a more uh, concentrated meaning of a word if you add on vowels to it. That's why even today there is a huge debate whether you should call God Yahweh or Yehovah <laughs> just because of vowels, you know? So this is what I mean. So ancient Hebrews are the text of the Old Testament. Most of our Bibles today are from the Masoretic texts. But there are also some other translations which uses the text from the Dead Sea Scrolls, okay? And which is why you will sometimes see a different translation in some of the words and even in some of the numbers of figures, they have comparison that scholars use, okay? It doesn't mean that there is an error, that the Bible is not correct. It's just because of, like I say, when you add on vowels and when you use an, an older translation text. And some also follow the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. The Septuagint was written about 250, approximately 250 BC. So again, some use that Septuagint trans translation, which is why they, there are some differences between some words in the Old Testament. But the oldest translation is called the Ancient Hebrew Translation. And uh, some scholars will still go back to that for references. So th the Old Testament is very unique, very intriguing. But I want to say this, doesn't matter what the translation is. You go to a bakery, it doesn't matter if you get wholemeal or white bread or roti bun, it is still bread. Do you hear that? Of course, if you want to really go deep into the meaning of the word, then when you do word study, that's what we do. We do comparisons, okay, from this translation. So we want to get the actual, the closest meaning to it. Hallelujah. Which is why I always encourage people to get either an NKJV or an uh, ESV, English Standard Version Bibles, which is, I would say, the closest to the original. Either NKJV or ESV. 
uh, what you say, what about NIV? Well, NIV is good for the Old Testament, but it's not that correct for the New Testament. Okay? So, hallelujah. Now, analytical. That's the process of viewing the Bible worse by words to go in depth into the study of the word. Then you have topical or doctrinal view of the Old Testament where you study it according to its many topics. So, for example, you want to study about redemption, for example. You go to Abraham. He's the father of redemption, right? So God redeemed the world through Abraham. You can go to Noah, like what we studied last week, last two weeks. Noah, again, is a father, was a father of redemption. So this is why I call topical studies. Or you want to go into doctrines, you know, you can study the characters and some of the laws that were written. Moses gave us Ten Commandments. God gave Moses another 246 different laws. So you have 10 commandments and 246 different laws. So these are what we call doctrines, okay, in the Old Testament. So you can derive from that. And some are applicable, some are no longer applicable. For example, when it comes to all those ceremony things, you know, you had to wash the lamb this way, take the intestine out, wash, you know, those are no longer relevant to us today. Why? Because Jesus is our Passover lamb. So there are certain things in the Old Testament, you know, that's no longer relevant to us. Observing how you're going to break the bread, how to cook the bread, how much, how much of flour to put inside, whether it's leavened, unleavened, all these are no longer relevant to us. Okay, but we observe the feast because they are prophetic. We observe the feast because it is God's timeline for events for the church. We celebrate its meaning. We don't follow its ceremony. Do you get that? Then you have typical study, which is a study of the many prophetic pictures or types found in the Old Testament. One of them is the characters of all the peoples in the Old Testament. These are also typical study, study of their prophetic significance because they are a foreshadow. They portray the truth. Hallelujah. In the New Testament. Wonderful Lord God Almighty. In the book of Psalms, I believe, when we go to Psalms, I will show you all the messianic prophecies in the book of Psalms, okay? But of course, in, uh, in your book as well, in your notes, in page 17, if you will go to page 17 quickly, these are several well-defined stages of Old Testament prophecy. You have the pre-monarchical Prophecies, okay? Pre-monarchical means before there were kings. Before God established the kingdom in Israel, right? And you have all those, like, right, all those who wrote uh, in those days, like Abraham, the Moses, Aaron. Uh, you have Miriam. You know, Miriam wrote a messianic song. Who is Miriam? the sister of Moses, okay? So when they came out from Egypt and when she was singing and she was dancing, you go to the song, it was messianic, you know? So these are what we call Old Testament pre-monarchical uh, prophecies. Then you have Medad and Eldad. Um, these are two young prophets. <laughs> Deborah, of course. Uh, and then you have Samuel, right? Then you have... Uh, the non-writing uh, monarchical uh, writing where they, they, they address the king, so I put there, many of them, the prophets who wrote during the time of the kings, their names are there. Some of them don't have names, just messianic prophecies. So these are all, uh, pro and some of the prophecies are not just messianic, but they are end time, eschatological, 
there are prophecies concerning the end time, especially in the book of Daniel, uh, in the book of uh, Zechariah, and so on. Hallelujah. Then you have the third group, classical writing prophets, okay? And of course, uh, all these, they wrote about the nations of Israel, they wrote about the end times from Isaiah to the book of Malachi. Hallelujah. Glory to you, Jesus. So, I want to show you the timeline here. Go back to the slides. Now, someone asked me this the other day and say, Pastor, how come uh, the, some of the charts, uh, the, the, the writing fade a little bit, right? You notice that in some of your charts, you know, like in, in the book of Genesis, when you go to the chart in, Genesis, in page 20, you see or not, the, the writing fade a little bit. You go to page 20, you can see that in your charts, right, some of the writing fade a little bit. The reason why they faded is because in the original, they are red in color. Huh? Right? Because this is printed black and white. <laughs> Okay, so simple, right? Hallelujah. Now, all these charts are taken from Charles Swindle Bible College. Charles Swindle is a theologian, and he, he runs a very prominent, he's also one of the professors who teaches, I think, in the D.L. Moody Bible Institute. So most of the charts that you see in the books are taken from Charles Swindle uh, Bible College. Okay? And... Uh, so that's why in their original, they are colors. So when I converted them, they become a different color. The same as the charts here as well, but at least this one is more clearer. Uh, your Old Testament timeline, just go there quickly. Now you have here what is called universal history another word for this is the anti-diluvian uh, period uh, before you come to the flood here somewhere around this part here okay so this is universal history or the history of how everything started then you come to the call of abraham and you can see the timeline here about 2200 bc okay and surprisingly, the book of Job was also found there. You see that? So that's why the Old Testament is not in chronological order. Okay? It is written in the order where you put the Torah first, then you put the historical books, then the poetic books, then the major prophets and minor prophets. It's written in that order, okay? But not chronological. Because the book of Job is actually one of the earliest books in the Old Testament. Okay, so you have Job, and this is during the time when Abraham was called. Then you have the period of the patriarchs. Who are the patriarchs? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the 12 sons of Jacob, the tribes of Israel, the forming of, of Israel, okay? Then they all went to Egypt again. There was a period of time they were in Egypt. And then there was an exodus that comes out from there. Then you have the wilderness, the 40 years of wilderness. So the scholars put the date line 1446 is Give or take approximately around that time. 1446, 1440. Right, that was when they came out from Egypt. So, if you would ask me then, when did, when did Moses start writing Genesis? Somewhere here. Because Moses only started writing when they came out. And it was in the wilderness that he starts to journal and God starts to give him inspiration. And when he went up to the mountain, because I asked the Lord one time, I said, Lord, how did Moses know about creation? 
Genesis. He was not born yet. And the Lord said to me, when he was up there on the mountain, 40 days, got a lot of time on, you know. 40 days, 40 nights, you know. He was there. God starts to reveal so much to him. I tell you, Moses, <laughs> Moses has the greatest memory. I sigh. <laughs> Greatest memory, you know. He can remember Ten Commandments, 246 laws, and he can remember everything that God told him about Genesis, and he came down and he wrote them down, you know. Amazing. Hallelujah. Greater than a computer. <laughs> so, this is when the Bible was written. Okay, of course, some debate when we talk about the book of Job. Some also debate who wrote the book of Job. Okay, but we'll come back to that when we have the book of Job. So, come back to the timeline here. Then you enter Canaan around 1400 BC. And here onwards is about Joshua. It's about you. It's about Joshua and the conquest, okay? And roughly in this, in this period of time, you know, you have the, the conquest, the conquest of the Canaan or the promised land and how Joshua was able to conquer most of all the cities. But, you know, Joshua, a little bit stubborn, you know, Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 1, verse 2. God told him, You must wipe out all those, the, the what, the, the, all the Jagasai, the Jebusai, <laughs> all the Hittites, Hewites, and all the Penangites. <laughs> hallelujah. Uh, you are still awake. Hallelujah. And termites. <laughs> you know, God told him, Wipe out all this, but you know, he didn't. Okay? He didn't wipe out, even with the Philistines. Later on, you know, God wants them to, to conquer the Philistines, but they did not. The Jebusites as well, they did not. Which is, you know, the reason, the reason why today you have Gaza problem in Israel and Hamas problem is because they did not obey God to wipe out the Philistines. Do you know that the Philistines are the ancestors of the Hamas? In Gaza, huh? right? These are the, the people there, the, the ancestors, the Philistines people, the Jebusites as well. So that's why you have all this problem today because Joshua didn't wipe out all of them. Then after that, you have the period of the judges. And during this time, God raised up judges. It will be very interesting when we go to the book of Judges because in every book, when we start Genesis next week, okay, in every book, we'll go through all the outlines, we'll go through Christ revealed, Holy Spirit work in those books. We're going to go into that application, principle and application in every book. And we are going to talk about one main passage in every book that is beneficial and relevant to us today, okay? Hallelujah. The reason why I didn't put it in your workbook because I do not know what passage God wants me to speak. So it's not in your workbook. Hallelujah. Now, then you have the beginning of the kings. Ha. Israel had three kings for 120 years. Each one reigned 40 years. You have King Saul, 40 years. King David, 40 years. King Solomon, 40 years. After that, Habes divided. Northern Kingdom and Judah, Southern Kingdom. So for 120 years, they were united with three kings, you know. And it was, it was a time when David took over. Of course, David laid the ground. But when you come to the time of Solomon, do you know that for 40 years when Solomon reigned, there were no war? No wars, you know. 
Solomon prosper and prosper and prosper. But he also marry and marry and marry. That's why lah, susah. Ah, uh, no war ma. Hokkien say japa bo mengyacho. Nothing to do, too, too free. You know, ah, that's why lah, so much problem until so many concubine. <laughs> then uh, after and porcupine. Uh, <laughs> Too many concubines become porcupine, huh? <laughs> then you come here where the divisions started, and uh, you have all the kings, and because you have it in your charts, you have all the different kings. You have the good kings and the bad kings, okay? And then after that, you have the fall of the northern kingdom. That's when the Assyrians came and invaded. So now you see here the writing prophets. So you know when they start to write. So you know their contemporary date when they started writing the book of Hosea, Joel, Amos, Isaiah. All these were written during this time before the fall of the northern kingdom. All right? And some of them prophesy about the fall. Northern kingdom, Assyria. Southern kingdom, Babylon. Okay? Then after that, you have the... Exile period. You have, of course, Daniel. He was in Babylon. And after the exile, when they came back again to the promised land, of course, it was led by Ezra, Nehemiah. Esther was also written during that time. Oh, now you know when it was written, right? Esther, during the time, huh? post-exilic period. And after that, you have the writing of Zechariah, Haggai, and Malachi, and after that, 400 years of silence before Jesus came. Hallelujah. So let me just take you quickly to the genealogy of the kings. And as you can see here, when the kings, when the kingdom was divided, you have Saul, you have David and Solomon, Okay, David had have three, have, uh, three sons, Adonijah and Absalom. Both of them wanted to kill him. Very interesting life, you know, this David. I think one day we had to do a series on David himself. <laughs> you read his life, uh, oh, yo, I tell you, uh, you think that you have enough problem, uh, his problem, uh, two sons want to kill him, you know. <laughs> Hallelujah. So, Solomon... You know, these two are legitimate sons. This one, illegitimate. <laughs> but out of this, you see, God loves to turn what is wrong around for good. You know, amazing. So out of that, you have Rehoboam. Now, Rehoboam came, Abijah, Asa, Jehoshaphat. We know about Jehoshaphat and all that, you know. But you see, there's this other guy called Jeroboam. This Jeroboam Unya Bogaman. This guy, uh, what he did was mention uh, 40 times, you know, the sins of Jeroboam. The sins of Jeroboam. 40 times his name was mentioned. You know why God really despised this guy? He's not even from the royal line, you know. He's just one of the servants of David at that time and he rebelled. Okay? You know why God despised this guy? Because he divided the kingdom. He took one part of Israel, he caused the church split. <laughs> and he told, he brought one part of Israel out to the northern kingdom and he starts to have his own priesthood, you know. Not from the Levites. He starts to ordain his own priest and he built a temple in Samaria. That's why God hates compromises. And the sins of Jeroboam is always mentioned in the Bible 40 times. So you have from this guy, you have all these kings, okay, of what is called the northern 
kingdom, all these red ones. Now, all these uh, Ahab, you know, remember Ahab? Ahab, Mary who? Zezebel, all right? So you have Ahab, all these kings. All these kings are uh, evil kings. Generational curse. All of them, evil kings. These ones here, some good, some turned bad halfway, some became bad and then halfway turned back to become good again. <laughs> so, you have a whole motley crew here of Yehoshaphat and then Ahaziah, you know, all these Hezekiah, some of them that, some of them that you know more in the Bible, like Yehoshaphat and of course, uh, Hezekiah and so on, okay? And so these are the good ones. So that was when the kingdom was divided. This is a prophetic picture because these are all children of Israel, you know. This is a prophetic picture of the ten virgins. Five are wise, five are foolish. This is a prophetic picture of the New Testament church where there are half, I would say, five wise ones who have oil in their lamp and another half who are compromised or the compromised church. Do you see that? Even that itself is a prophetic timeline of the church today. We have half in the body of Christ today who have compromised or have diverted to false doctrines and wrong teachings and so on, you know. So, but nevertheless, these are the stories of redemption. I want to close with this to tell you that the Old Testament is a novel that portrays the Father heart of God. Man fell at the garden. And later on, the whole human race got corrupted before the flood. And after the flood, the third falling at the Tower of Babel, where man again disobeyed God and God had to scatter them. But God preserved a righteous family from Abraham's lineage. Of course, from Noah, from Shem, and then to Abraham, 10 generations after Noah. And then from Abraham came this family. And this is the family that God raised up to become the redeemers of the world came Israel from this family. Out of this family, Israel was, was born. And out of Israel, God starts to indoctrinate them about worship, about godly values, about a standard of holiness. God called them, you are a holy nation. You are a holy priesthood. Even when he called them out of Egypt, out of slavery, he says that you are a holy generation. That's Exodus 19, verse 5, verse 6. You are the royal priesthood, a people separated unto me. You see, God always, God is always looking for the people that is separated unto him. And the, new, the Old Testament is a story of that. It's a novel that God shows to us that he is looking for the people that's after his heart. And then after that, they came out from Egypt and then they started to fall again with all the pagan culture. God says, don't touch unclean animals. They go after unclean wives. Even worse, <laughs> they start to compromise with the Moabites and then all that kind of things that happen. And you see, when you, when you start to intermarry, you will start to follow the idols of your spouse. You get what I'm saying? That's why they follow the, the Baal worship of their wives. And after that, God raised up 
judges to deliver them. Because of idolatry, they fell. Again and again, they fell. God raised up judges. The most famous one is Samuel. We know about Samuel. Of course, we also know about Samson, Deborah. When we come to the book of Judges, we'll touch on their story. And then the people wanted a king for themselves. God plan is always the best plan. From the very beginning, he planned Israel, his princes, a people chosen, a people that came out of a struggle and a people that has been changed and renewing their identity. They were called Israel. Out of Jacob came Israel. And God always wants Israel to be a theocracy. You know what's a theocracy? A nation where God is the king. A theocracy. But they wanted to have their own kings. And so they go and choose this big, handsome, tall guy called Saul. God did not choose Saul, you know. They chose Saul. That's why Saul messed up. Why? Because Saul was chosen by man. And because they wanted the king so much, they wanted to follow other neighboring nations because all the neighboring nations have kings. And they wanted to follow them. But God said, I want to be your king. But they rejected God. So because they wanted their own king, God also had to give in. You know, many times the father gives in to our demands that is not beneficial to us. And God raised up a shepherd boy called David. At least he found someone that's after his own heart. But even that, David also messed up, you know. Go and look at someone bathing. <laughs> but people of God, you see, the whole storyline in God's novel is that even though when we mess up, God is able to clean us up. You hear that? No matter how messed up we become, as long as we have a heart that's after his heart, he cleans us up. And when he cleans you up, he has no more memory of your past, you know. You know that? Hey, in, in heaven, uh, there is no museum, one, you know. <laughs> God don't keep a history. There's no museum in heaven, you know. He don't keep your history there. Hallelujah. And he raised up David. And out of that, because of David's compromise, there is a generational curse that came. Nathan, the prophet, says, your kingdom will be divided and true enough. Jeroboam came. Bogam with Rehoboam. So divided the kingdom. And out of that, we see again and again how God would try to raise up a good king. And in all these days, a value here that God is teaching us that no matter how good we try to become, we will never be good enough, which is why we need a savior. Which is why the Buddhists need to hear this, the Hindus need to hear this. No matter how much religious work and charity and good work you do, no matter how good you try to be, you will never be good enough. We need a savior. That's why we need Jesus to save us. And so it was a whole story of a beautiful novel that God wrote. But the main storyline or the main macro theme of the Old Testament is about redemption, reconciliation, restoration that leads to the revelation of Jesus. That is the whole main theme of the Old Testament. That is God's story. How He come and interact with man and how he come to always 
clean up our messes. Because out of that came the lineage of the Messiah, Jesus. God who sees the end from the beginning, He saw everything before it happened. He knew what must take place. That's why He's always there. When Israel got out to the left and to the right, got out of God's covenant plumb line, God have a way to kick their backside back into His will. So that they will walk along that path. So that out of that, God wants to make sure that out of that, Genesis 3.15 will be fulfilled. That out of the seed of the woman, he will crush the head of the serpent. Out of that will come the Messiah. Out of that will come Israel, the church. We are talking about Israel, the nation. Here we talk about Israel, the church. You know who is that? That's you. Do you hear that? You are the Israel of God, the church. That's why Galatians 3 says that he who is in Christ are the seeds of Abraham. We are the heirs of the Abrahamic covenant. So the Old Testament is a beautiful picture. And when we study every book, you are going to see in depth how Christ is revealed in those books. The prophecies that people like Isaiah prophesy so accurately about the coming Messiah. He even know, he even know how Jesus is going to be born. Zechariah, hallelujah. He even know that one day Jesus will ride on the donkey. All these are beautiful prototypes of the coming Jesus. That's why when we read the Old Testament, read it as a story, read it as a novel, read it as a doctrine, read it in a prophetic light to see Jesus in every book. And then in every book, you also see the revealing power of the Holy Spirit and how we do going to apply each book into our life. Amen? Hallelujah. So, thank you for all the questions. And Lord, thank you for some of the answers. We may not be able to satisfy, satisfy you with all the answers, but you ask me very hard questions, you know. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. So, the Lord bless you. And we'll see you next week. We're going to start with the book of Genesis. Amen. The Lord bless you. The Lord be with you. And the Lord bless your going out and your coming in. Surrounded by favor. Amen. Give him the glory.